Hi, welcome to Research Issues Related to BC Unit 3 Psychology, presented by Andrew Chua. Now, the hypothesis is an educated prediction of how one variable, the independent variable, is affected by a change in another variable, the dependent variable. Now, an extraneous variable is any variable that could have an influence on the results, that is, they can affect the dv. Now, extraneous variable is any variable that could have an influence. After you finish your results, you might find that there's an extraneous variable that did affect the results, and that is called the confounding variable, an extraneous variable that did affect the results. Now when you're thinking about any research, you need to first of all think about your population. That is, who are you interested in studying? And the population involves the total number of all individuals in that group that you're interested in. So say for example, if you're interested in Australians, your population will be all Australians. Or another example, if your interest group are Year 12 girls in Shepparton, your population would have to be all Year 12 girls in Shepparton, all girls doing Year 12 in all of Shepparton. Now obviously the population is pretty hard to usually get every single individual, and so that's why we choose a sample, that is a selection of individuals from the total number of, of people that you're interested in. So, say for example, again, if you're interested in Australians, the population is all Australians, which is approximately 21.4 million people right now in 2010. So, therefore, if you want to get a sample, you would possibly choose only a thousand. Now, you can either have a representative sample or a unrepresentative sample. Right, so you can see in this diagram here that uh, there are different types of people groups in, a, in this total population. A representative sample will make sure that the characteristics appear, that appear in the population also appear in the representative sample. So the representative sample is, the, is a selection of individuals from the total group you're interested in, uh, that reflect the characteristics of the total population. So say, for example, if you're again interested in sex uh, um, or gender, uh, if your interest group uh, is all Australians, your population are all the approximately 22.4 million Australians that are all over the country and possibly overseas your sample would be a thousand Australians and to get a representative sample you would want to make sure that roughly 50% of your sample were women and 50% were men. So it would represent the proportion of, you know, of, of individuals in the total population. Now sampling procedures is about how you select your sample or those individual participants. Now there are three main sampling procedures convenient sampling, random sampling and stratified sampling. Yes you can combine some of these so you can have random stratified sampling or convenient stratified sampling. We'll talk more about that later. The first sampling procedure is called convenient sampling. Now in convenient sampling it might be like say you're interested in surveying everyone or well, surveying a sample of year 12 students you might just choose whoever just happens to be in the study hall at that time when you're doing the research now the problem with convenience sampling is that every individual in the population does not have an equal chance of being picked to be a participant in your sample now this can lead to what's called a bias sample, which is obviously not representative of the total population. In order for your sample to be truly random, what you need to do is make sure that every individual in the population has an equal chance of being selected to be 
a participant. One way of doing that is to put all the names of every individual into a hat or a computer program and choosing your necessary number of individuals. Now obviously random sampling is much more work than convenient sampling. So random sampling you need to ensure that every person in the population has an equal chance of being selected. So when you did that experiment whereby you just chose whoever happens to be in the, the study hall, you're actually missing out on a lot of people that could have, you know, who are part of your population. All right. So therefore, you know, that is convenient sampling where you just choose whichever people are around versus random sampling where you actually have to intentionally make sure that every person in the population has an equal chance of being selected. Now the third sampling procedure is called stratified sampling and this involves identifying the proportion of a different characteristic or strata in your population, say for example gender and ensuring that your sample contains a representative proportion of the different groups of that strata. So as I said before, if you wanted to make sure that uh, you had a, you know, equal numbers, you find out what the proportion of girls to boys are in your population and make sure that that is representative, that is represented in your sample. Um, another example could be if you're interested in age groups, you'd have to work out how many people of each age group age group is in your total population and then ensure your sample contains the same proportion of each of those strata as in your population. So you'd have to work, make sure that they have the equal number of babies, children, teenagers, adults and elderly as you would have in your population. You'd have to make sure that's present in your sample. So of course stratified sampling is even more work than random sampling. Now, you can then have, well, once you've uh, chosen your sample, you then need to allocate them into experimental or control groups. The experimental group is where the participants have the IV altered to see what effect the treatment has, e.g. drinking 600 mils of an energy drink and then testing their time for running 2Ks. Now, your control group is where the participants do not have the IV to see what effects no treatment has. So at the same time they'd be drinking 600 mils of water and then testing their time for running 2Ks. Now if we really want to minimize extraneous variables we want to make sure that the personal characteristics in the experimental group are as similar as possible to the characteristics of those in the control group. So what we want to do there is to then make sure that how the participants are allocated to the experimental group or the control group is random, where there's an equal chance of each participant being placed in the experimental group or the control group. This will help minimize the possible individual participant differences in abilities, personality traits or anything else that could influence your results. So say for example, you don't want to, you know, when you're trying to see if the energy drink has an impact on running speed, you don't want to accidentally or intentionally have only professional athletes in the experimental group and only amateurs in the control group. Random allocation is about whether a participant has an equal chance to be in the experimental group or control group, whereas random sampling is about whether an individual has an equal chance of being chosen to take part or not be chosen from the total population. Random sampling is about whether they've been picked out from the population, equal chance of being put in the, the study to begin with, where random allocation is that once participants are in the study, whether or not they have an equal chance of being in the experimental group or control group. That ends part one of research issues for psychology VC unit three. Thanks for listening.